Thank you, ISCM, for giving me this meeting is being recorded. For giving me the opportunity to present about the basics of the trauma management, as Dr. Mahender just now described, that the road traffic accidents has been the major part of the injury. So around one million people, like annually, one million people die because of this road traffic accidents, and nearly twenty million to the thirty million people are uh, having grievous injuries because of this road traffic accidents. So it is important to know the life-threatening injuries. So we need to concentrate on the basics of the advanced trauma and the life support. This advanced trauma and the life support course it deals with the basic management of the trauma patients. So the main concept of this ATLS is to treat the greatest threat to the life first. That means which kills the patient first should be identified and treated in order to save the patient. So never go for the never allow the lack of definitive diagnosis to impede the application of an uh, indicated treatment. So a detailed history is not essential to begin the evaluation of a patient with the acute injuries. So whenever a patient presents with the acute injuries, we have to first assess and implement the treatment strategies rather than taking a detailed history. My slides are not moving. Something stuck, it seems. While dealing with these trauma patients, while the clinician quickly assess the trauma patients and while he instituting the life-saving measures, time is most critical. So to save the time, there is a systematic approach to follow the accurate and the rapid assessment of these patients. We follow a systematic approach that comes under these elements. It uh, comes under the initial assessment of the trauma patients includes the following elements. So first comes the preparation. So first from the scene of the crime, this comes the pre-hospital or the hospital preparation. First from the scene of the trauma itself, uh, the trauma leader and the trauma team has to inform the receiving hospital about the requirements of the patients. So while receiving to the hospital, a resuscitation area should be available for the trauma patients and the, all the airway equipment should be functioning and they have to prepare the vomit fluids and they should have a protocol to summon the medical assistance for place and if it overwhelms the resources, then they should have sufficient equipment for the transfer of the patients also. So in view of the contagious diseases, standard precautions has to be followed, like wearing a cap, gown, mask, shoe covers, goggles, and the face shield are necessary. First, the priority of the primary healthcare providers is most important while treating the trauma patients. So coming to the triage, triage is sorting out the trauma patients depending upon the resources required for the trauma patients to treat and the resources which are available in the hospital. So when the resources required for the patient matches the resources available in the hospital, that time we'll call it as a multiple casualty. So when the resources required overwhelms the capacity of the hospital, at the time it's called a mass casualty, then we have to make arrangements for transportation to the other hospitals or we have to triage like which patient requires the minimum intervention and have the higher likelihood of survival with lesser time. So here goes a question. Like uh, this is a trauma scenario with a 34-year-old male coming to the ER with the history of uh, road traffic accident. And he presents with uh, hoarseness of voice and a blood pressure of 80 by 40 millimeters of mercury with a respiratory rate of 35 per minute and a pulse rate of 130 per minute. And he's showing a contusion in the right chest wall. Then after seeing this case scenario, now what is the first thing that comes to your brain? Like how will you proceed with this case? So I'm just requesting the answers like how will you proceed? So what is your first priority? in these four options. Mm. 
yeah, only three members they responded. We expect more persons to respond. Okay. So, in order to understand the priorities, like which thing to treat first, there is a systematic approach. Like we have to proceed first with the airway. So, airway A comes first. So, first maintenance of the airway with the restriction of the C spine motion, and then next is B. So, maintenance of breathing and ventilation. And the next is circulation with the hemorrhage control and assessment of the neurological status comes in D and then exposure and environmental control. So the clinician quickly assesses the A, B, C, D with a 10 second assessment. That is, he first asks the patient about what is his name, what is his or her name, and asking what had happened. If he answers these questions quickly, that means if he is opening the mouth and answering what is his name, it means the airway he is not he is able to protect his airway and the airway is not compromised. And if he is able to tell his name also, that means he is generating adequate tidal volume to tell his name and that is permitting his speech also. That means his breathing and ventilation is not dangerously compromised. And if he is able to recall the sequence of the events like uh, how it happened and what has happened, then it means his uh, sensorium is also intact that is permitting him to recall the events. So if he answers these questions correctly, then his uh, ABCD can be ruled out. Then if there is anything wrong in that, then there is something wrong in this ABCD, then we have to proceed with the sequence. So first to look for the airway patency. First ask him to open the airway. If there is any obstruction like foreign bodies or fractures, just remove the foreign bodies and try to maintain the patency of the airway. If the airway is filled with blood or secretions, first do the suction. Then we can maintain the patency of the airway by doing the simple maneuvers like chin lift and the jaw test, which I will be showing in my further slides. And we can also maintain the patency of the airway by using the airway arteries. So when we need a definitive airway is whenever you have any doubt about the airway that if the patient is not able to protect his airway, then go for the definitive airway. When the patient is drowsy, if his GCS is below 8, that is a definitive indication for protection of the airway. When the patient has any non-purposeful movements, and if the patient is having hoarseness, dry air, or subcutaneous emphysema and palpation, those are the definitive indications for maintenance of the definitive airway. So while assessing and managing the patient's airway, we have to take the great care to prevent the excess movement of the cervical spine. While manipulating, if we do more extension or flexion of the spine, that will cause even more trauma to the patient by causing the complete transection or complete damage to the spinal cord. So this is the way how we have to do the C-spine protection. First, we have to keep it in line with the body. And we can use a semi-rigid cervical collar or headlock by using the hardboards or belts. And for uh, transportation of the patient, we have to use the standard spinal boards or the hard boards with the semi-rigid collar. While transporting the patient, while removing the cervical collar, one person has to stabilize his cervical spine. So here, yeah, when one second, can... uh, uh, somebody is asking to do more interaction class. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, uh, to discuss about this uh, primary survey, so we usually start with the airway breathing circulation, but the main, the main difference uh, with the ACLS and ADLS is here we should maintain the uh, cervical spine uh, mobility. So while uh, ma managing the airway, uh, doing any maneuvers. So that is one of the important uh, aspect here. Uh, so if you have any specific question related to the airway, you can just uh, uh, type it on the question marks, chat box. So this is the chin lift maneuver. When we see this picture here, the tongue is falling behind the palate and it is uh, obstructing the airway. 
so this might uh, uh, compromise the patency of the airway just a simple chin lift maneuver here just putting your finger and applying the pressure over here will keep this airway patent while doing this we should not damage the spine so avoid hyper extension of the spine so one person should be here to maintain the inland stabilization of the spine one person should have to hold the ears and have to maintain the spine stabilization and while the other person lifting the chin so this is the jaw thrust maneuver this is same as the chin lift we have to apply the pressure from the angle of the mandible with a forward thrust this also helps in maintenance of the airway patency so these are the simple maneuvers which will keep the airway patent so while doing this the most priority should be given to the c spine we should not damage the c spine and have to maintain its stability so these are the airway adjuncts oropharyngeal and the nasopharyngeal adjuncts this oropharyngeal adjuncts even after doing those maneuvers if the patient is not able to protect the patency of the airway we can go for any of these airway adjuncts so i'm knowing the size of this uh, oropharyngeal airway is important here is a question can you please type your answers in the chat box it has a b c d three options so i'm requesting to type the answers how will you decide the size of a oropharyngeal airway Can you please read out the answers? Like, yeah, most of them are writing A. And yeah. yeah. A is the right answer. Like we have to measure from the midpoint of the incisors to the angle of the mandible. So before placing a oropharyngeal airway. measuring the size is important because placing a oversized airway itself can obstruct the airway and it can compromise the airway patency so we have to take care before placing the oropharyngeal airway just measure the size of the airway and then place it and have to take care of the spine also and the nasopharyngeal airway we have to measure from the lateral edge of the nostril to the tragus of the ear so once the if he is not able to protect the airway even after doing the maneuvers after using the airway adjuncts then that is the time for going for the protection of the airway with the definitive airway so the definitive airway is placement of a endotracheal tube if it is a difficult one we have to go for the other airway devices so the sequence of the maneuvers are as follows first ask the patient to open his mouth and look for the patency of the airway do suction First, try to maintain uh, the airway with the airway adjuncts like or a pharyngeal airway. If it's not possible, go for a definitive airway with the endotracheal tube. So, since it is a trauma patient, we don't know what are the fractures he sustained. Sometimes there uh, there will be some massive trauma to the airway. So, we might say if it's inland stabilization of the spine, it might be a difficult intubation also. So, we should be ready for the supraglottic airway devices. And sometimes uh, needle cricothyroidotomy and the surgical cricothyroidotomy set also should be kept ready. So, how will you intubate a trauma patient? What all the things we should keep ready? for intubating a trauma patient so first the equipment failure should not be there so the working laryngoscope with spare batteries should be kept ready and different sizes of the laryngoscopic blade with different sizes of the endotracheal tubes also should be kept ready for the intubation a functioning functioning suction cannula should be kept ready before intubating the patient since it is a anticipated difficult airway like two person who are expertise with the management of the airway should be available in your team so while one person here maintaining the c spine in inline stabilization the other person will go and intubate the endotracheal and do the endotracheal intubation so while intubating the patient we can remove the anterior part of the cervical collar so at that time to protect the spine the second person will assist to keep the spine in the inline so since for, uh, we have to keep all the drugs ready for the intubation like succinyl scolin and etomidate it should be a drug assisted uh, intubation and then also the difficult airway things like cricothyroidotomy and surgical thyroidotomy sets also should be kept ready 
So yeah, that means uh, somebody uh, has asked one question: that, Is there any difference between Parkinson's tracheostomy and the cricothyroid or thing? Are they same or different? See, uh, the like Parkinson's tracheostomy is uh, that can be secured uh, over uh, later. Cricothyroidomy is basically an emergency situation uh, where you have to place one needle into the cricothyroid member membrane. In situations where you are not able to secure the airway with the intubation, and if, if the patient is not getting ventilated even after the intubation, okay, suspecting some like obstruction, airway obstruction. In those conditions, initially we'll uh, place one needle, then later it can be converted into the percutaneous tracheostomy. Yeah. Uh, yes. So the major pitfalls which occur during this are the equipment failure. So we have to make sure to check the equipment regularly with the spare equipment and the spare batteries available. So identify the person who is expertise with the airway before performing the endotracheal intubation. So one thing which we have to make sure is as long as the patient is unconscious, don't remove the neck collar and the backbone till you have a radiological proof of the whole spine is intact. Next, we have secured the airway. Does that mean that the patient will get the sufficient gas exchange? You are not sure because the good gas exchange needs an intact chest wall and intact lungs and an intact diaphragm. So we need to assess for the breathing pattern that will be carried out in the breathing survey. So all injured patients should receive the supplemental oxygen. Even if the patient is not intubated, you have to give the oxygen by a mask. So in the inspection and uh, palpation of the breathing, there is three things like look, listen, and feel. First, we have to look, inspect the chest wall, uh, chest wall, the equal rise of the movements or the adequate chest wall movement is there or not. Then you have to auscultate for the air entry. And next thing is you have to do the percussion. So in addition to this, other airway adjunct, other uh, things like uh, ultrasound and all those things will add on to our assessment of the breathing. So the things which we'll identify in this survey are mainly pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax, any hemothorax or any flail segment or any patient having any cardiac tamponade. So here, these are the abnormal findings on our inspection or primary survey so what will be your inference in this? On inspection, you notice the inequality in the chest movement. So you auscultated with the stethoscope. So there is a definitely decreased air entry. And on percussion, you notice there is a hyper resonant notice there on percussion. And the patient is tachypneic and he is desaturating. So from these findings, what is your like, diagnosis? What will you interpret? So the possibility of uh, anyone answered us? So I'm not able to hear you. Can you hear me now? Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so two members answered. So like pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on these findings, we can suspect the pneumothorax. So it can be confirmed with either the ultrasound or the chest X-ray. So an immediate intervention like uh, we can decompress with the needle or we can place an ICD. So if it is a simple pneumothorax, you can place an ICD. If it is a tension pneumothorax, we have to immediately decompress with the needle and later on go for an ICD. So why the diagnosis of a simple pneumothorax is important is it can be converted to the tension pneumothorax when a patient is intubated and when we apply the positive pressure ventilation. So this is the tension pneumothorax. Here we can see the entire chest wall cavity is filled with the air 
and it is even pushing the media stream towards the opposite side so recognition of this is important when it goes into tension pneumothorax it actually impedes the filling of the heart and it can endanger the patient life within a minute so this is also a image showing the pneumothorax and these are the abnormal findings like when you look at the chest wall after immediately after the intubation there is an unequal rise and there is decreased air entry on auscultation and when you try to percuss there is a dull note and the patient is tachypneic and he is desaturating also so what is your inference with this in a trauma patient Yeah. yeah, that that can be hemothorax in a trauma patient. The dull note and percussion could be because of the fluid correction, unless otherwise fluid, it might be because of the blood only. So immediate decompression with an uh, uh, ICD has to be done. This is a massive hemothorax. Actually, demonstrating. So sometimes the other thing, cardiac tamper note should not be missed. So what is a cardiac tamper? So this is the pericardial space. Here in the major trauma, sometimes there is an accumulation of the blood because of the trauma within this pericardial space, and that can impede the filling of your ventricle. So this might present as on auscultation, there might be decreased heart sounds and hypotension will be there, and we can see the distension of the veins also. So this is an X-ray demonstrating a massive pericardial effusion. So once this is identified, the appropriate measures has to be done. Immediate decompression has to be undertaken; otherwise, it will endanger the patient life. So next, to moving to the other thing that is the circulation with hemorrhage control. First, there is a question called what are the signs of shock in a trauma patient? Yes. These answers uh, for three members responded. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So all of them are correct. Like we can see the altered mental status, pale extremities, and the rapid thready pulse. So the other signs are like postural hypotension, tachycardia, tachypnea, narrow pulse pressure, whole extremities, decreased urine output can be seen in these patients. So you secured the airway of the patient. And immediately after securing the airway, the blood pressure is 80 by 40 with a pulse rate of 130 per minute. And the patient is pale. So what is the next step in the management? How will you proceed? Please write the answers. Yes. Yes. Correct. Yeah. A is the correct answer. Yeah, A is the correct one. Immediately, you have to secure two large bore IV catheters and start the fluid bolus. So, in a trauma patient, unless until otherwise proved, hypotension is always because of the hypovolemia, that is because of the blood loss. So, securing a two large bore IV catheters, usually in the antitubital veins, is of important. So, usually the preferred ones are will go with 14, 16, and the 18 catheters. So it's sometimes difficult to secure the peripheral axis, then we might have to go for the central venous axis also. So after securing the axis, we have to immediately send, for the, send the blood for the cross matching and have to alert the blood bank also. So then start the fluid. What type of fluid we need to start? Usually the preferred one is balanced crystallite solutions. Usually the preferred one is plasmolite. And how much we need to administer is also important. So usually we need to give a bolus of one liter in the adults and 20 ml per kg in the pediatrics. And the fluids which we are giving should be warm enough. Otherwise the patient will go into the hypothermia. So we have to make sure to give the warm fluids. Initially a fluid bolus of one liter should be given. So next, after giving the one liter of the fluid, what we have to do is we need to assess the patient, whether he responded to the treatment or not. So... Then they are classified as uh, rapid response, transient response, or non-responders. So in case of the rapid response, 
there will be blood loss of only 10 to 20 percent was there so immediately after giving the one liter of the fluid bolus their vital signs usually normalizes whereas in case of the transient response they transiently respond and then deteriorate in case of the non responders there will be a blood loss of more than 40 percent would have occurred so they are non responding so immediately we have to alert the blood bank and call for the blood transfusion <laughs> Classification of the hemorrhagic shock is classified into three classes, class, two, class two, class three, and class four. So the approximate blood loss in the class one is less than fifteen percent. In the class two, it is fifteen to thirty percent. In the class three, it is thirty to forty percent. When it is more than forty percent, that we call it as a class four shock. So the heart rate and the respiratory rate are normal in class one and class two usually because of compensation, whereas in class three and class four, they usually increase. Blood pressure and the urinary output all will come down in the class three and the class four. This is decompensated. Here they compensate for that. And the patient will be having altered sensorium also in the class three and class four type of the hemorrhagic shock. And the base death sheet also we have to see by doing the blood gases. It will be more than minus 6 to minus 10 or even more than minus 10 in the class 4 hemorrhagic shock where it will necessitate the immediate massive transfusion. So next there goes a question. What is the medical triad? Can you please try to answer this? The correct answer is it is a triad. So it consists of the three elements like hypotension, acidosis, and coagulopathy is the right answer. Why this is called lethal is if you won't break this triad like acidosis, hypothermia, and coagulopathy, like the fourth thing that is death is inevitable. So that is called the lethal triad. And is there any role of uh, uh, tranexamic acid in the management of trauma and this was said by the CRASH-2 trial like if you give it within less than three hours like one gram bolus usually at the scene of the accident followed by a one gram infusion over eight hours it has shown to reduce the mortality in small group of the patients. So next to what are all the resuscitative measures we have to apply to reduce the damage. First one is the permissive hypotension. That means we have given the IV fluids, about the one liter of the fluid is given and have transfused the blood transfusion also. Still the blood pressure is showing 80 by 40 or 90 by 60 only. So we have to accept a certain amount of the hypotension until the definite control of the hemorrhage, the bleeder, definitive site of the hemorrhage has been controlled. Certain amount of the hypotension is permitted. But this is usually not permitted in case of the traumatic brain injury patient. You can accept a SBP of 80 to 100 and a map of 65 millimeters of the mercury. And after giving one liter of the fluid bolus, so it is necessary to call for the blood transfusion rather than going on giving the crystalloids because that will cause again the dilutional coagulopathy. So giving more than 1.5 liters of the crystalloids has shown to increase the mortality, especially in the trauma patient. So it is mandatory to institute the blood products like early in the process of the resuscitation rather than giving more amount of the crystalloids. So when we are giving the blood transfusion, it is necessary to combine the or balance the ratio of the PRBCs, plasma and the platelets. Usually the advisable ratio is one is to one is to one. Suppose we are giving four PRBCs, so we have to give the plasma FFP and RDPs also in the same ratio rather than giving only the blood transfusion, PRBCs. That will decrease the coagulopathy, which is an important uh, component in the lethal triad. And identifying the site of the bleed and stopping that is also important. When we see externally some fractures which are bleeding, application of the direct pressure sometimes stops the bleeding. 
and uh, tourniquet application you have to be careful while applying the tourniquet because that will again compromise the distal perfusion and sometimes packing the wound also helps in stopping the bleeding the four areas of major hemorrhage are it can happen in the chest abdomen pelvis or extremities so we have to first assess with either the ultrasound or chest x-rays and we try to minimize the bleeding by going for the hemorrhage control that is what is called the damage control surgery this is mainly done for the bleeding control and decontamination of the body cavities the aim of the procedure is not to go for the definitive repair like definitive repair of the operation it's not the goal like we can restore the fissure we can stop the bleeding close the abdomen and how to optimize the patient and have to take for the definitive repair at a later stage so unless until the source of the bleeding is not controlled the blood pressure and everything won't get optimized so it's only for bleeding control you have to do the surgery a quick next comes the d d means disability so a quick assessment of the neurological system is carried out by determining the sensorium of the patient usually this is uh, done by using the glasgow coma scale and check for the pupillary size and uh, a strict neurological examination to look for the signs of lateralization and also assess for any spine injury so after controlling the hypoxia and uh, hypotension if the patient is still having the altered sensorium that means something is wrong with his brain so we have to suspect some brain injury so the primary injury to the brain occurs because of the direct trauma so that can be in the form of contusions sdh edh and all those things comes under the primary brain injury our main aim in this assessment and uh, resuscitation is to prevent the secondary brain injury. for their hypoxia and for their hypotension which will again cause the secondary brain injury which is more injurious to the patient so this is a question can you please try to answer it it's uh, on the glasgow coma scale so the patient is opening eyes to the painful stimulation and in the motor response there is withdrawal to the pain is present and he is having inappropriate speech so it is the d is the correct answer so we'll quickly go through the glasgow coma scale so it has the three components like everyone might be already knowing it has eye opening verbal response and the motor response eye opening if the patient is spontaneously opening the eyes we'll rate it as e4 on our call if we call him by his name if he is responding that is e3 only to the pain then it comes the e2 and if he is not responding even to the painful stimulation also we label it as e1 so there is no zero response here the least score we can give is 1 and about the assessment of the verbal response orientation if the patient when we ask him questions if he is oriented to the time place and person if he is telling the day and where he is and what's his name then we can rate him as b5 if there is some confusion then it is v4 if he is using inappropriate words then it is v3 so in our case he is v3 because he is using inappropriate words and when he is not at all vocalizing only making the sounds then it comes as v2 if there is no response then we label it as v1 suppose if the patient is intubated we label it as vt and coming to the motor response if the patient if you ask the patient to lift his spine if he is lifting that that is m6 that means obeying the commands even if the patient if the patient is paralyzed if he is having quadriplegic is not able to move any of his limbs if you ask the patient to show his tongue if he is showing the tongue then also we have to label it as m6 because he is obeying the commands because this glasgow coma scale is related to the brain not the spinal cord so if he is showing the tongue we have to label it that comes under the obeying of the commands and we have to label it as m6 and if you give a pain on one of his limb if he is able to move the other limb to localize the pain where we are giving to the point of pain then it is m5 if he is just to withdrawing then it is m4 and this uh, if he is doing abnormal flexion and abnormal extension they come as m3 and m2 so i will show you the pictures later 
so the best response is 15 and the least response is 3 we have to intubate a patient when the gcs is 8 or less so this is the decorticate procedure this is the abnormal flexion of the arms when we apply the pain on the sternum so he will show this abnormal flexion with the internal rotation of the feet and this is the decerebrate posture where the patient will show the abnormal extension the arms are extended and curled and toes are pointing downwards with extension so when we see these three postures it will tell about the poor prognosis so next during the primary survey we have to do a thorough examination of the patient for that we have to undress the patient by just cutting away his dress and do a thorough examination usually in the skin folds armpits or groin genitalia will be missed so we have to do a thorough examination by quickly undressing the patient and covering him immediately with the warm blankets because we have to take care of the hypothermia also and also log rolling the patient is important to examine his back and the spine for doing this we need the three persons one person have to take care of the cervical spine and the other two have to turn the other part of the body while log rolling the patient we have to keep in line the c spine the remaining body the neck and the remaining body have to be turned at the same time avoid hyper extension and excessive movements because that will cause even more trauma to the spine so during the exposure the pitfalls are there can be hypothermia even before admission to the emergency department or it can develop in the emergency department room also so maintaining the patient's body temperature is important rather than the comfort of the healthcare provider so we have to reduce we have to increase the temperature of the resuscitation room we have to use the warm blankets and warm the fluids before administering these are the steps we have to take to avoid the hypothermia because this is also an important component in the lethal trial so and the other agents which will help in the primary survey are assessment of the vital signs pulse oximeter etc co2 arterial blood gases and the urinary and the gastric catheters and ecg and this uh, focused assessment of the sonography for the trauma ultrasound assessment of the chest and the abdomen also helps in the quick assessment of the site of the collection of the fluid usually we will see at the right upper quadrant left upper quadrant in the pericardial space and uh, in the supra pubic space and right under the left chest anterior part of the chest consider early transfer of the patients and we should not delay the time for the diagnostic test so next comes the secondary survey so the secondary survey doesn't start unless the primary survey is completed and all the resuscitative measures are done and there is improvement in the patient's vital condition so if at any time during the secondary survey if you see the patient is deteriorating that is constant reassessment is necessary then we have to again go to the primary survey and again have to come from the a b c d so in the secondary survey like taking the history is important like first to go with the history the mnemonic which we use to remember is the ampul like any history of allergies what are the medications he is currently using any history of past illnesses pregnancy last meal and the events or the environments related to the injury has to be taken and also the type of the trauma so whether it is the blunt trauma penetrating trauma thermal injuries or any hazardous environment he has exposed also should be noted so secondary survey is head to toe examination we have to meticulously see from the head to toe what are all the injuries we have to assess and we have to apply the resuscitative measures first coming to the head we have to inspect for the lacerations contusions the raccoon eyes black eyes and how to look for the palpate for the fractures the assessment of the base of the skull fractures is also important so look for the rhinorrhea and one more thing which is a key in the examination of the head is assessment of the visual acuity we can just ask the patient to read the letters or count the finger and look for the pupillary size and the symmetry is also important because assessment of the visual acuity might be difficult in the later stage because of the edema and all he won't be able to open the eyes and look for the maxillofacial fractures this can be done by simply asking the patient to open his eyes 
and ask him to do the occlusion. So if he is able to do that, we can simply rule out in any patient with all these maxillary facial fractures or head trauma, uh, having the head lacerations and contusion. We have to suspect the C spine fracture. Any detailed examination of the chest and the abdomen is done by inspection for the lacerations, contusions, hematomas, and also palpate for the tenderness, percussion, and sometimes the e fast and X-rays also can help in the assessment of the site of the injury and site of the fluid collection. So once when, when, once the patient is stabilized, we can go for the CT scan for the definitive diagnosis. So assessment of the pelvis is important because that will be the major site for the blood loss. So pelvic fractures are identified first by seeing the ecchymosis over the pelvic wings, pubis. So we can come to a assessment by X. We can do a confirmation by the X-ray and have to stabilize with the pelvic binder or sometimes clamps on the fixator can be used to stabilize the pelvis. Next comes the inspe in inspection of the extremities. So we have to look for the wounds, swellings, contusions and the source of the bleeding and palpate for any loss of the peripheral pulse, click of the fracture and the compartment syndrome. So the diagnostic tests which will help us in the urgence are the X-ray, CT scan of the head, chest, abdomen, spine, ultrasonography and uh, sometimes bronchoscopy and transesophageal ultrasound also sometimes may be necessary. So that completes the primary and the secondary survey. So who all included in the trauma team is a team leader, airway manager, trauma nurse, trauma technician, and various uh, uh, medical and the surgical residents are available. Yeah. This completes the okay, about the that. basics of trauma management. Like I covered only the primary and secondary survey. Thank you, Madam, for such a elaborative discussion on the basic management. So we'll invite questions from the audience. So if you have any question, you can, I think, uh, unmute and ask us, or you can type your questions in the chat box so that uh, we'll come back to the debate. Somebody wrote uh, F, actually, F for fluids. There is no such F in uh, this thing. Actually. You want it to E is there, A, B, C, D, G. A is for airway with cervical motion restriction. B is breathing with ventilation. C is with circulatory uh, support with the hemorrhage control. D is like disability. E is for exposure and environment control. There is no F. Somebody wrote F. Excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So if there are no further questions, I think we can wind up the session. Yeah. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present the basics. Thank you, sir. Thank you.